أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 164 سورة الأنبياء آية number 1 to 19 سورة الأنبياء is a Makki سورة and it was revealed after سورة إبراهيم and this سورة just as سورة طاها was also revealed in the early part of the Meccan era it has been reported in Bukhari that Abdullah said that سورة بني إسرائيل Surah Al-Kahf, Surah Maryam, Surah Taha, and Surah Al-Anbiya. They are among the earliest and most beautiful surahs, and they are my treasure. So all of these surahs are from the early part of the Meccan era. Which ones? Surah Al-Isra, Al-Kahf, Maryam, Taha, and Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya is called Anbiya because many prophets of Allah are mentioned in the surah. Many prophets of Allah are mentioned, not just by name, but briefly their accounts are also mentioned. And this surah has a total of 112 verses and 1,186 words. In the previous surah, at the end of surah Taha, we learned, فَتَرَبَّصُوا Keep waiting. قُلْ كُلٌّ مُتَرَبِّصٌ Each is waiting. And keep waiting. And at the beginning of this surah, what do we learn? اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ The time of the account of people has approached. It has drawn near. It has drawn close. So we see that there is a connection in the ending of the surahs and the beginning of the next surahs. In the previous surah we learned, فَتَرَبَّصُوا And over here we learn, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ اِقْتَرَبَ is from the root letters قَافْ رَبَ and اِقْتِرَاب is when something approaches when something comes close when it has drawn near so iqtaraba lin nasi for people it has drawn close what has drawn near hisabuhum their account which people are these these people can be understood in the general sense that all people for all mankind their hisab has drawn close their accountability has drawn very near And Anas may also be understood as specifically the Mushrikeen. Because they are the ones who are being reproached over here. Because they were the ones in denial of the hereafter. And Hisab is accountability. When a person is made to question about the deeds that he has performed. And Hisab, remember, is the first part of the jaza, of the recompense that a person is to receive in the hereafter. Depending on how the hisab is going to be, the rest of the jaza is going to be like that. So, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ The hisab of the people has drawn near. What does it mean by this hisab? It refers to the Day of Judgment. That the Day of Judgment has come very close. It's not too far. And others have said that hisab also refers to death. Because after death in the grave... what will happen? The hisab will begin. The questioning, the accounting will begin right after death. So, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ While they are in heedlessness. They are in indifference. They are completely careless. With regards to what? With regards to this hisab. How? That they have left it, they have stopped worrying about it, they have stopped preparing for it. And mu'ridun, they are ones who turn away. Meaning they are not afraid of it. They are not afraid of the approaching hisab. Why? Because they are so indulged in their desires and because of their denial of the hereafter. This is the state of who? Yes, it is the state of the disbelievers. That their death is approaching. The day of judgment is coming. However, it is as though no disaster is coming their way. No calamity is coming their way. They are in ghafla, they are in negligence, they don't fear it, they are not preparing for it. Mu'ridun, they are busy doing other things. But however, this is not just the state of the disbelievers, but it is the state of people in general. That death is approaching them. Every single moment, a person is drawing close to his death. Every single day, a person is drawing close to his death. And instead of preparing for that death, many people are heedless towards it. The majority of the people are careless about it. They don't pay attention to it. 
If you think about it, many people set their goals for the day, for the week, for several months, for the next year, for the next five years. People have many, many goals. And amongst those goals are things that are very important and are also things that are not that important. But the most important event that is ever going to happen in a person's life is what? It's his death. It's his death. How many people are actively preparing for it? Actively preparing for it. If you think about it, typically, people have plans as to what they're going to do in their 20s, what they're going to do in their 30s, when they're going to have children, when they're going to get married, when they're going to buy a house, when they're going to buy their own family car, when they're going to move on to this and when they're going to move on to that. People have many plans. And all these plans, people dream about from the very beginning. But how... How many times is it that a person thinks about death? That my death is approaching? What is it that I have to make sure I do before I die? What is the list of things that I want to make sure that I do before death approaches me? وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةِ Most people are in negligence. They're not preparing for it. مُعْرِضُونَ They turn away. We see that the most important responsibility of all the messengers who came was to call people to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The surah is Al-Anbiya. And the surah tells us about the work that the messengers did. The work that the prophets of Allah did. And all prophets of Allah, they called people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the same time, they also warned the people about the approaching day. About the day of judgment. So that the people can prepare for the hereafter. However, from the beginning to the end, This has been the attitude of people. That they are warned, they are told, but they don't take it seriously. Now a person may wonder that over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ If we take the meaning of hisab to be the day of judgment, it has drawn near. A person might say, it's been 1400 years since this ayah was revealed. 1400 years. But still the day of judgment has not come. So what does it mean by that? اِقْتَرَبَ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ What it means is that the day of judgment is approaching near as each day passes by. And the time that is left for the day of judgment to come is less than the time that has elapsed since the beginning of creation. The time that is left for the day of judgment to come is much less compared to the time that has elapsed since the beginning of the creation. And at the end of the day, Whatever is approaching is near. كُلُّ مَا آتٍ فَهُوَ قَرِيبٌ Everything that is coming, it is approaching, it is near. Because once the countdown has begun, then you're just waiting. That's it. It's only going to be a few more moments. And very soon it's going to happen. مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ No mention comes to them. مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ From their Lord. مُحْدَثٍ That is new. إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ Except that they listen to it وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ While they are at play. This is their ghafla. This is their negligence. This is their indifferent attitude towards the coming of death, towards the coming of the Day of Judgment. That مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ ذِكْرٍ No dhikr comes to them. What does the dhikr refer to? The Qur'an. Meaning, Any new reminder, any new revelation that comes to them, مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ From their Lord, that is muhdas. What is muhdas? That which is new. That which is fresh, latest. So any latest reminder that comes to them from their Lord, whether it is latest in terms of its revelation, or it is latest in terms of their getting to know about it, إِلَّا اسْتَمَعُوهُ Except that they listen to it attentively, meaning they understand what is being said, وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ But still, they play. What does it mean by this? وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ Meaning, while they're listening, they're playing. Meaning, they do not listen seriously. They do not listen attentively. They don't give importance to it. Instead, what do they do? They laugh it off. They ignore it. They mock at it. Warnings are being recited to them. Warnings are being told to them. But what happens at the same time? Instead of becoming fearful, instead of their hearts getting soft, they only increase in their play and amusement and having fun. And وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ is also understood as that they listen, but then they go and play. Meaning they do not get affected by the warnings of the Qur'an. 
They don't take any lesson from it. They go back to their play and they get busy in that. This ayah describes the ghafla and the irad of people. That what is their ghafla? You see, sometimes people are in ghafla, people are in negligence, they are indifferent to something. Why? Because of lack of knowledge. They have no idea about what they are ignoring, what they are missing, what they are leaving. And because of that, they are in ghafla. So what's the reason? Lack of knowledge. But over here, who is being described? إِلَّا It is those people who know, those people who are warned, but they still turn away. That with every wahi that comes, with every new revelation that the Prophet ﷺ tells them about, with every new surah of the Qur'an that they come to know of, with every new reminder of the hereafter, what happens? They only turn away. They do not take it seriously. They do not get affected by the warnings of the Qur'an. They listen and they go back to their homes, to their play and amusement, as if they didn't even hear anything. It's as if the Qur'an does not affect them. This is their state of ghafla. That they listen to the most scariest of ayat that describe the punishment of the hereafter, for instance. That describe the end of those people who are arrogant towards the ayat of Allah. For example, yesterday we learned about the consequence of those people who come to know of the ayat of Allah, but then they ignore them. What's the consequence of such a person? That he will be raised blind on the day of judgment. This is a severe warning. But think about it. How many of us are really affected by it? That we make a firm resolve that I'm never going to leave this Qur'an. Not even for a day. That what I have memorized, I'm going to start revising it. وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ Most people, what happens to them? They listen. Maybe temporarily they get moved by it. But then they go back to their homes. They get busy in their conversations. They get busy in their play. In their cooking and their cleaning and their eating and their talking. And they forget about what they have learned. They forget about what they have heard. Because their life does not change. When somebody has really been affected by something, then what happens? Their life changes. Their thinking changes. Their ways change. Their habits change. Their routine changes. And if somebody remains the way they were before, then what does it mean? Nothing has affected them. So the majority of the people, this is their state. They come to know of what Allah is saying. They come to know of the warnings. But وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ What's the reason behind that? لَهِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts are distracted. This is the reason. Their hearts are distracted. لَهِيَةً is from the root letters لَامْ هَا وَاو And لَهِيَةً is اسم فَاعِل One that is in لَهُ One that is engaged in لَهُ And what is لَهُ? Everything that distracts a person from an important purpose, from an important task, from an important cause. Anything that distracts a person from what is important. It is said, لَهَوْتُ كَذَا Meaning I got distracted from an important task and I got engrossed in something else. Like for example, a person is going to prepare food towards the kitchen and all of a sudden they see somebody watching TV and they stand by looking, oh, what's this commercial? Okay, what's going on now? Oh, there's a movie coming? Let me see and watch it. Now, she was on her way to cook. And there she gets distracted by the television. This is called lahu. When someone is distracted from something that is important by something that is less important. So, lahiyatan qulubuhum. This is the reason behind their heedlessness. That they are distracted from the dhikr of Allah. They are distracted from bringing about a change in their lives. You see, the actual function, the real purpose of the heart is tadabbur. It is to reflect. It is to take a lesson, to ponder, to feel, to bring about a change in a person's life. This is the real purpose of the heart. But since there is only one heart that a person has, he can only do one thing at a time. Because hearts, they cannot multitask. You can use your hands to multitask probably. That with one hand you're doing one thing and with the other hand you're doing something else. Some people are able to do that. Or with your body you're multitasking. You're listening to a phone call and at the same time you're cooking for instance. You can multitask. But your heart, remember, it cannot multitask. Which is why in salah, 
you can either focus on salah or you can think about other things. You cannot do both things at the same time. Similarly, either you can be listening to someone, paying attention to them, thinking about what they're saying, or you can be dreaming about something else while they're talking to you. You cannot do two things at a time with your heart. So if the heart is occupied by something that is less important, how will it be able to focus on that which is more important? لَاهِيَةً قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts are distracted by this dunya. And they're distracted from the dhikr of Allah. This is why they are in ghafla. This is why they are heedless. This is why they don't take a lesson from the reminders that are given in the Qur'an. This is why they are not preparing for their death, for their hereafter. So what's the reason? If you think about it, the problem begins with what? With not preparing for the hisab. Then the reason behind that is ghafla. Then the reason behind that is lahiyatan qulubuhum. So if a person wants to get affected by the Qur'an, then what does he need to do? Free his heart. Free his heart. If your heart is occupied with other things, with the love of other things, with the concern of other things, then you cannot be concerned about your death. You cannot be concerned about bringing about a change in your life. Because your heart can only do one thing at a time. It's either the Qur'an, it's either your death, or it's something else. Now choose that which is more important. وَأَسَرُّ najwa, And they conceal the private conversations. Who? The people of Mecca, the mushrikeen. They conceal the private conversations. Notice najwa is a private conversation. It is a confidential talk which is not publicized to everybody. And when the word asarru is used, what does it show? That how much they try to conceal these conversations. Who tries to conceal the private conversations? Alladina zalamu. Those people who do zulm. And what's the zulm that they're doing? Shirk. So what is it that they talk about in the private conversations? That hal hadha illa basharum mithlukum. Is this man not except a human being just like you? Is this meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa not a human being just like you? Then how can you believe in him? Why should you follow him? Why should you be lesser than him? When he's a human being just like you, what's so special about him that he is a prophet and you're an ordinary man? Why should you follow him? Why should you believe everything that he says to you? هَلْ هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ أَفَتَأْتُونَ السِّحْرَ They say to one another that would you approach magic وَأَنْتُمْ تُبْصِرُونَ While you are aware. What does it mean by this? أَفَتَأْتُونَ السِّحْرَ أَفَتَأْتُونَ has been understood as that would you come to Meaning, would you accept and follow the sihr? Meaning, atattabi'oon as-sihr. Afatattoon as-sihr, meaning, atattabi'oon as-sihr. Would you follow magic while you see that it is clearly magic? Secondly, afatattoon as-sihr has been understood as that would you be affected by it? Would you come under its effect? Would you come to listen to it? Would you approach in order to listen to this magic? What do they mean by this magic? The Quran. What the Prophet ﷺ was reciting to them. The dhikr, the muhtas, the dhikr that he was reciting to them. They called it magic. Why did they call it magic? Because it mesmerizes people. It brainwashes people. It enchants people. They listen to it once and they get so affected by it. So the mushrikeen of Mecca, what would they do? Instead of getting affected by the warnings instead of taking benefit from the Qur'an that the Prophet ﷺ was reciting to them, what would they do? They would sit in private conversations and they would discuss as to what they should say about the Prophet ﷺ. And they would try to assure one another that no, this man is only a human being, we're not supposed to follow him. So if you don't believe in him, you're not wrong. So what do we see over here? That their ego, their pride, their arrogance it prevented them from believing in the Prophet ﷺ. That why should we follow him when he is only a human being? When he is an ordinary person? In fact, he is lesser than you in worldly terms. So why should you follow him? Just as today even, many people, they object believing in the Prophet ﷺ and following him. Simply because they say that he was a human being who lived 1400 years ago in the desert of Arabia and today we are so advanced we are so knowledgeable 
you know, we're in a technological age. We are so much more knowledgeable. Why should we be following a person who used to live in the desert 1400 years ago? And such people, even though they claim to be Muslim, they don't respect the Prophet ﷺ. So what is it that prevents people from believing and following him? It's pride, it's ego. Whether it is suffered by the people today or it was suffered by the people of that time. The people of Mecca, it was their arrogance that هَلَّا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ He's only a human being. Why follow him? In Surah Al-Taghabun, ayah number 6, we learn, فَقَالُوا أَبَشَرٌ يَهْدُونَنَا فَكَفَرُوا وَتَوَلَّوا But they said, shall human beings guide us? And they disbelieved and they turned away. Just because it was a human messenger, what did they do? They refused to follow him. And then the mushrikeen of Mecca, they would discuss this issue in their private meetings. Now the question is, why would they discuss this issue in private meetings? Because when they would say things like this, هَلْ هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُنَا This is what? Negative talk about someone. You're talking negatively about someone. You're humiliating them. You're insulting them. And typically, private conversations, private meetings, what is their subject? It's such things that are not acceptable if set out publicly. When do we need to whisper to one another? When what we say is not going to be acceptable to others. Because a person who is talking negatively about others, people don't respect him. People don't like him. So whenever they would want to talk negatively about the Prophet ﷺ at the beginning stage, remember the surah is of the beginning era of the Meccan period, so they would sit together in private conversations and they would conceal those private conversations from the rest of the people so that nobody would find out. Because ghibah generally is done how? In private conversations. And also, they would speak about this issue in private meetings because they differed amongst themselves. At one point, they would call the Prophet ﷺ a magician. At another point, they would call him a poet. And if these differences were publicized amongst people, then what would happen? Nobody would believe in them. Nobody would follow them. So over here they say that he's only a human being. And then they say that he's a magician. أَفَتَأْتُونَ السِّحْرَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُبُصِرُونَ Meaning don't listen to him. We see that all the prophets of Allah, they were accused of being magicians. Musa alayhi salam, what did we learn in Surah Taha? That he was also accused of performing magic. We learn in Surah Al-Dhariyat, Ayah 52, that كَذَلِكَ مَا أَتَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا قَالُوا سَاحِرٌ أَوْ مجنون. Similarly, there came not to those before them any messenger, any messenger, except that the people said, a magician or a madman. And even today, what happens? If somebody begins to study the Qur'an, and their life begins to change, what do people say? It's as though you have been brainwashed. It's as though you have been mesmerized. You have been enchanted. That you're not using your mind anymore. Are you sure you're okay? Are you sure you're not affected by something? Maybe there's something wrong. This is what people say. قَالَ رَبِّي يَعْلَمُ The Prophet said, My Lord knows. All of these accusations that they were hurling at him, that he's a magician, he's a poet, he's this, he's that. The Prophet said, رَبِّي يَعْلَمُ الْقَوْلَ My Lord knows the word. Which word? Which statement? That is uttered فِي wal ardi. That is uttered in the sky or the earth. Any statement that is uttered, that is voiced out, that a person says, whether it is said in the earth or it is said up in the sky, who knows about that statement? Who has heard that statement? My Lord has heard it. So whether you secretly, in your private meetings, you say such things about me, or you go and say such things about me publicly, my Lord knows. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ Alim, And He is the hearing and He is the knowing. He has heard what you have said and He knows of your state and He knows of my state as well. So what do we see in this ayah? That people can say whatever they want. People can hurl whatever accusations at you. Whether at your face or behind your back. Because sometimes people don't have the confidence to say something on your face. What will they do? They will go and talk to others about it. At that time, how should you comfort yourself? Allah knows. He has heard. The angels have written. The angels have recorded. And on the day of judgment, justice will be established.